This week on Vaticano, we follow celebrations at the Vatican for the 140th anniversary of the apparition of Our Lady of Knock. Meet the rector of the shrine, Father Richard Gibbons, and learn all about the details of the apparition and the first recognized miracle of healing at Knock. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Pope Francis inaugurated the first Sunday of the Word of God with Mass in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Spirit of God. Amen. La pace sia con voi. E con il tuo Spirito. Inviting a greater awareness of Holy Scriptures through the new worldwide celebration. Until now, there was no feast dedicated specifically to the Bible, and the Holy Father established that from now on, in every church of the world, the Word of God will be celebrated on the third Sunday of Ordinary Time. reasons behind the Pope's choice of this specific Sunday? Bible scholar Father Alvaro Pereira explains. The Pope has sought a great Sunday. He chose it between Christmas and the beginning of Lent, a Sunday in which we are immersed in prayer for Christian unity. Moreover, Scripture is what unites us with our Reformed brothers and sisters and with the churches with whom we share together the sacrament of baptism. Therefore, this Sunday of the Word of God teaches us that Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John the way to unity, that we may be one. St. Jerome, in this sense, is the one who shows us a way to holiness through the scriptures and prayer with the Word of God. This is why the Pope wanted to convoke on September 30th, 2019, the day on which we began the celebrations of the Jubilee of St. Jerome. The Sunday of the Word of God was established with a papal decree titled, He Opened Their Eyes. Marking the 1,600th anniversary of the death of the most important Bible scholar and father of the church, St. Jerome. St. Jerome claimed that ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. Using this argument, Pope Francis in his homily reminded that the Word of God is crucial for our faith and it's for everyone and not just for chosen ones. Dear brothers and sisters, let us make room in our lives for the Word of God. Each day, let us read a verse or two of the Bible. Let us begin with the Gospel. Let us keep it on our table, carry it in our pocket, read it on our cell phones, and allow it to inspire us daily. To fulfill his invitation to read the Holy Scriptures on a daily basis, the Holy Father made a symbolic gesture, giving away copies of the Bible to 40 people of different backgrounds and ages. Including the young, iconic Italian soccer player, Niccolò Zaniola. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. Oh, 
Holy Mass on the Sunday of the Word of God was celebrated in Rome in the presence of Irish pilgrims who brought the processional statue from the shrine of Our Lady of Knock. The events of 140 years ago in Knock, Ireland are unlike other apparitions of the Virgin Mary because of their direct link with the Word of God. It's such an honor for, for the shrine and for the country, for Ireland itself, and for our little parish, our little parish of about 2,000 people hugely significant and the significance is that Archbishop Fisichella, the president of the Pontifical Council for New Evangelization, visited Knock last year and he noted that connection with St. John preaching the Word of God and obviously he was making a connection which we didn't know at the time with the celebration of the Word of God and so as we discussed this we said well would you like our pilgrim statue to come out because I, we noticed that at times the statue of the Madonna is beside the papal altar. And so that link was made. And uh, so the link there is important for us, that the Word of God is important in the apparition, that it's linked in with the promotion of the Word of God on Sunday, and it has a local and a universal message. And we're very, very happy with that. presence of Our Lady of Knox pilgrim statue at the Word of God Sunday, the Vatican wanted to relaunch the message of the apparition that is both Eucharistic and evangelical. But what exactly happened in 1879 in a tiny and remote village in Ireland that the Pope wanted to link forever with the Word of God Sunday? In 1879, the 21st of August, 1879, it was a Thursday evening, 8 o'clock, 8 p.m. in the evening, people were coming home from their work and surprise, surprise, it was raining. It rains quite a lot in Ireland. So it was raining that evening and uh, people saw as they were passing a light at the gable end of the parish church. Now you have to understand Knock is in the middle of nowhere. There was a very a few little houses around the church uh, and nobody really would be passing through Knock. So the church is very significant there and can be seen. So they saw a light and they went up, what's this light? So they approached the church and they could see figures. So word went out then to the village itself, there's something going on at the church. And as people approached, they saw three figures, St. Joseph, Our Lady, St. John the Evangelist, holding a book. Um, at the center then was an altar, a lamb and a cross around which some of the witnesses said that they saw angels, creatures with wings hovering. Very light, right, right around the cross itself. <clears throat> so people came and they observed it. The apparition lasted two hours. Everybody could see it, which is a very unique element uh, in terms of the apparition, because normally like, let's say, Lourdes or Fatima, it is only two, three children in Fatima to, to St. Bernadette in Lourdes and in other apparitions just to a select number of people. In Knock, the whole village saw this. Uh, in fact, one worker in a field beside, uh, not too far from the church, thought because of the brightness of the light that the church was on fire. And he, he called out an alarm. So, um, and that's quite a bit of, away. So the apparition lasted two hours, nothing was said. No, no words were communicated. The communication was in what the people saw. So it's, it, it was very Catholic, if you like. At the center is the Eucharist, the Eucharistic element, the altar, the cross, and the Lamb. Then Our Lady, the, the, the love that Irish people in particular have, have for Our Lady. It's, it's like the way Italians have great love for La Madonna. And um, jo St. John with the Word of God, preaching in, 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 in a pose of preaching and St. Joseph, the protector of the church. So, um, like I say, the apparition lasted two hours and then just simply disappeared. And people like you and I were um, intrigued and they wanted to go up and touch to see uh, if this is real or are we thinking this or what. Uh, but they couldn't feel anything, but the figures were real. They were moved, there was movement in the figure, in the figures. And where the apparition took place, the ground and the wall was dry. So as everything else was wet from all the rain, absolute, uh, the church and, and the ground underneath was absolutely dry, which was a, 
um, very unusual too. News of the apparition at Knox spread quickly and the place began to attract large crowds. In 1954, during the Marian year, Pope Pius XII blessed the banner of the Knox Shrine at the Vatican. The number of pilgrims that year exceeded one million. In 1979, Saint Pope John Paul II visited Knox for the 100 year anniversary of the apparition and granted the then brand new Church of Our Lady of Ireland the status of Basilica. In 1993, Mother Teresa visited the shrine. In 2018, Pope Francis came to the shrine as part of the World Meeting of Families. But what's the secret of the shrine that attracts so many pilgrims? There are three messages. Uh, it is a place of hope, a place of peace, and a place of reconciliation. That's what Knock offers to people. Uh, and that comes from the apparition. On our confessional, uh, confessions, as you know, pro possibly here in Italy, in parishes, they're non-existent practically, except at Easter and at Christmas. But in Knock, people come to confession all the time. Uh, I call that our engine room. That's, the di that's where the miracles happen and the dynamic happens in the confessional. So it has a reconciliation message. It has uh, um, people that come to Knock wouldn't even think about going to confession, but they see others going or maybe going to Mass, or maybe just saying a prayer. And they come in and they say, oh, might be a long time since I went to Mass or to confession, and they go. And it gives them such peace and hope and joy uh, that they in turn then speak that to other people. And that, that is the message, hope, um, peace and reconciliation. Many people received graces and miracles here. The first recognized official miracle was recognized last September. The investigation was going on a long time, 30 years. A long time, because we have to be sure, uh, you, you, as you well know, if somebody comes in and tells you that you're healed, you don't automatically say, great, healing. You have to investigate, you have to have a commission, you have to make sure it's right, you have to make sure that scientific evidence is proper and that there's a process. Now it did take a long time, but the lady who was cured, Marion Carroll, very simply, she arrived in Knock 30 years ago with um, a condition, she couldn't move. Um, and then when the Eucharistic blessing, the bishop went around the basilica with the Eucharistic blessing, and she looked at Our Lady and offered the pain to Our Lady and saying, if there's a possibility. And he, as, as soon as the Eucharistic blessing finished, she just could feel something going through her body. She didn't, nothing happened dramatically in the, in, in the church, in the basilica. Then she was brought to another area and she felt she could get up. And people were frightened. <laughs> and she just got up out of, of the stretcher and seemed to be okay. And nobody kind of really, oh, it's something very funny going on here. And people were shouting, it were like, you know, saying that it was a miracle and all of that. Even the woman herself, she was saying, hold on, hold on, hold on, just calm down. Like, you, we just have to see whether this is what, what's going on here. But very simply, she came to knock on a stretcher and she walked in the front door of her own house to her husband that evening which is quite a dramatic story. That is one of the most dramatic stories that we have. Um, but that was only officially recognized last September. The celebration of 140 years of the apparition of Our Lady of Knock with Holy Mass at St. Peter's Basilica has a special meaning for the shrine. At the time of the events in Knock, the Irish people were forbidden from attending mass. And there's a saying in Irish that for the Irish, it's the mass that matters. The apparition at Knock strengthened devotion for the Holy Eucharist, and it was the Mass that maintained the faith of Irish people during very hard times and continues to maintain the faith today.
We'll be back after a short break with more on Vaticano. It's something that you would love to do, but I, I never dreamt that it would uh, be something that would actually happen. Um, Career-wise, it's, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity because it, it, it's really it's, it's the center of, of the faith for the Catholic faith for the world. So it's amazing to be able to sing there, and especially with Pope Francis celebrating the Mass also, which is wonderful. Uh, on a personal level, then faith, uh, I, I'm very interested to see. Um, a papal liturgy in St. Peter's. I've never been at one of those before. Um, the Pope visited Knock in Ireland, which was wonderful, um, but I've never seen it in St. Peter's. So I'm really looking forward to see that as well. And I think I, I'm hoping it will be a, a wonderfully spiritual experience as well. Una Nolan is the leader of the Schola Cantorum Basilica Choir from the Knock Shrine. For the first time, she performed the iconic hymn of Our Lady of Knock in front of the Holy Father when he visited the shrine during the World Meeting of Families in 2018. I think uh, music in the liturgy can be very important uh, when you connect it with the, the words, when it's connected with the text from scripture and ho holy scriptures. Um, I, I think it can bring it to another level. Um, and I, I think sometimes when something is sung, it gives it a little bit more um, depth and solemnity maybe to, to the spoken word and I think sometimes maybe it captures people's imagination also and uh, if, the if the music is particularly beautiful I think it can kind of transport you to another level. I, I feel myself as though I pray better when I'm singing. I, 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 th I feel like I've made that connection myself, that al that's almost how I pray the best. You know, I think it's probably because I've do done it like that for so long. Uh, I, I do love the connection of music with scripture and I, I feel it can be very prayerful. And I think if you kind of connect in your heart with it also, it can be very meaningful for, for the people listening also. In his apostolic letter, he opened their eyes. Pope Francis said that people need God's word so that they can hear, amidst the thousands of other words, the word that speaks not about things, but about life. And what could be a more effective way of transmitting the word of God than through a beautiful liturgy and music? message was hope. Uh, the movie's called Hope and that's what I believe the message that Our Lady St. Joseph and St. John brought to the Irish people at that time. The Irish people were going through a time of famine once again. Uh, there was many that have remembered the Great Famine that was 30 to 40 years prior and they were also having to fight for their land. Uh, they wanted their land back so the Land League was created and they were wanting to own their own land and to farm their own land. So at that time there were all of these pressures and people were hungry and I'm sure they didn't know what was going to happen next. Uh, there was the worry again of will it be like what it was like before? Over a million died and over a million had to emigrate. So the apparition gave people hope. It was going to get better and that's why we named the movie Hope. The EWTN docudrama Hope was screened in Vatican City 
a day after the Sunday of the Word of God. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation to the screening of EWTN Ireland's. The head of EWTN Ireland, Aidan Gallagher, opened the evening explaining why the Knox Shrine has such a global appeal. It was a great experience to get your movie shown in the Vatican. Um, yes, this was the second time that that happened, so it was wonderful um, to have the Knox people there, to have Father Richard Gibbons there, the rector of Knox Shrine. It was stressful because this was the first time that they were going to see my movie and how I told the actual Knox story. So I was hoping that they all would enjoy it and that it would meet their expectations. But to get your movie played in the Vatican, it's a great honour. Well, I'm absolutely delighted with it, obviously. The amount of work and the comprehensive nature of the film is extraordinary. The directorship of, of uh, Campbell Miller and what he has done in such a short length of time just shows not only the context of the apparition in Ireland in terms of the great famine of 1847, but also what not means to people today. I would like to congratulate to Campbell Miller and all those who gave uh, their hearts to make a, such a beautiful movie. Uh, Mother Mary, especially in my heart, because we also do have Mother Mary in Medjugorje, and I'm really glad that I get to know more about Mother Mary of Knock. Congratulate, dear guys, just go on. Well, I'm on my cell phone and I'm making a reservation to fly to Ireland. It was the most riveting story. I don't know, Nock, but I will. Because just to listen to the storytellers, obviously Father at the Shrine, the people who've been cured, the riveting stories, but added to the, the beautiful photography, the wonderful story of the people of the potato famine, and uh, every reason to get to know Ireland, to get a little closer to the faith, I think, through Mary. A beautiful, beautiful story and I can't wait to go to Knock. As someone who was fortunate enough to uh, be a descendant of a number of the witnesses and having grown up at home with stories of the night of the apparition and what it was like and stories of John Curry's immigration to the States, it's absolutely wonderful to see it here depicted in the screen and I think it's, it's very true to what happened on the night. It shows uh, the huge um, excitement and the wonder and the awe that all of those people experienced on that evening and it puts it into perspective for all of us that you know from the very eldest all the way down to the youngest child of five uh, they represent each and every one of us across all the stages of our own lifetime can we make coat dominic get your sister we'll go up and see what's happening where are we going get your coat on you catherine there's something happening up at the chapel come on Oh my goodness! The difficult thing with making a production like that is it was over, uh, it was 140 years ago, so you're having to make everything look like it was back then. Um, you're thinking about backgrounds, houses, costumes, the colours, but that that's difficult. Then you throw in an operation there in which we have St. Joseph, St. John and Our Lady, a lamb on an altar with a cross in the background and angels surrounding it. So how do you put that together? Um, so that, that there, there was a lot of trickery there. Um, we had, there was a lot of green screen work. East St. John, St. Joseph and Our Lady were green screened separately. So what I try to do when I make a docudrama is to bring emotion into it. And most of the time when docudramas or documentaries are created that have reenactments, they, they have different people in the reenactments. So you're not emotionally attached to anyone or any family. What I like to do is to bring people on a journey with that family because they were going through all of these aspects. And of course it is a fake family, but people still become emotionally attached to them. Um, they want to see them doing well um, and then of course, going through the famine, going into a famine ship and going off to America, they see the whole journey that this family went through and they really understand what it was like for the Irish people at that time. 
The movie is coming out on March the 18th uh, on the US and then the rest of the world it'll be put out after that. Now in the UK and Ireland it will be gone out later, it'll be gone out in August. But we will hope to actually have a cinema viewing um, in May, June time before that for hopefully over 90 cinemas throughout the UK and Ireland. Days later during the general audience, Campbell Miller together with the EWTN Ireland team handed a personal copy of the movie to Pope Francis.